Good evening, everyone. I'm Bruce Ronda. I'm the chair of the program committee and member of the board of the World Wisdoms Project. And it's my privilege and delight to greet you at the beginning of this 2018-2019 program year. I also want to describe briefly our program and its upcoming events. This past year has been one of change energy and planning for the future of world wisdoms. We said goodbye to our longtime program director, Denise Mayer, as she and her family moved to Seattle. And we said goodbye to our board member, David Reed, who stepped down after many years of service. A true and heartfelt thanks to those two people for their enormous contributions to theologian in residence and world wisdoms. And I know David is here, so let's thank him. We welcomed a new support coordinator, Abby Bain, who brings a wealth of experience and youthful energy to what seems like an ever-growing task, Abby. <laughs> And we were delighted to welcome to the board three new members, and if they would please stand as I call their names. Lori Goodham, she's in the back. Hello, Katz there. There. And uh, Paula Watson LeCamp, who won't stand up because she's not here, couldn't, couldn't be with us this evening. These three members bring special enthusiasm and expertise in the communications area, and all of the board members, new and returning, are wearing these handsome badges, which look like they came from the State Fair, but they didn't. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank all of you who are attending this evening, and those of you who have contributed financially to the work of World Wisdoms. We are, as you know, an independent 501c3 organization. We are reliant on your contributions to sustain and grow our programs and outreach. To learn even more about World Wisdoms Project, I invite you to visit our updated website at worldwisdomsproject.org and to follow us on Facebook. It will come, I think, as no surprise for me to say that we live in a time of extraordinarily deep divisions and angry confrontations in our political, social, and cultural life. Some of these divisions have been made worse and cynically manipulated for political advantage. But others emerge from real inequities and historical injustices in our nation and our world. As the program committee began to grapple with designing program and sessions for this year, we asked ourselves, what role did and does do world religions play in creating these divisions? But also, what role spiritual traditions and forms of expression might play in fostering deeper communication among people and varied histories? Back in January, Jim Reed and Maria Cox led a session here on metaphor, in which Jim observed that, quote, each and every individual on the planet is a storyteller and lives out those narratives in daily life. We have taken a cue from Jim and Maria to design a two-year program series called Shared Stories of Spiritual Journey. Like them, we are convinced that stories, especially personal ones, are powerful ways to reach deeper understandings of the background and beliefs of our neighbors. If we listen deeply and compassionately enough, 
Stories may also lead us to common ground and shared truths in this time of deep social division. This fall, story, shared Stories of Spiritual Journey explores the experiences and sacred destinations in the American Indian, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, and Islamic traditions. In winter and spring 2019, our program will focus on spiritual journey as moral growth towards care of the other, other people, and of the earth itself, featuring speakers from Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, and humanist backgrounds. And in 2019-20, our continuing theme of shared stories of spiritual journey explores the spiritual dimension of awe and wonder and considers the dialogue between sacred and secular values and practices. So I invite you to attend as many of these sessions as you can, to participate in whatever way you f see fit in the work of World Wisdoms, and of course, to contribute to our efforts. So I would like now to invite Board Vice President Bill Nealon to introduce tonight's speaker and describe our agenda. Bill. Good evening and welcome to you all. Um, Tink Tinker is a citizen of the Osage Nation, Wahaji, I think is how you pronounce that, is the Clifford Baldridge Emeritus Professor of American Indian Cultures and Religious Traditions at Iliff School of, of Theology. During his 32 years at Iliff, Dr. Tinker brought a distinctly Indian and politically liber uh, liberationist perspective to a predominantly white uh, Euro Christian school and continues to do so in his lectures across the continent. For nearly three decades, he has volunteered both administratively and as a traditional spiritual leader at Four Winds American Indian Council in Denver and worked closely with the American Indian Movement in, of Colorado. Tonight he's going to be talking about practices in the American Indian experience. Uh, the agenda is he's going to speak for 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be a question and answer session, and then he'll do a, a final statement of the takeaway. Uh, so, enjoy. Tink, and Tink's gonna, he's got a mic and he's gonna roam around on the floor. Uh, it's really good to see you all here, and I'm honored to be here with you all. We ask all the energies of the universe to come and center themselves here to be with us for this next little while. You know, I've been mulling over how to begin to address issues here with all of you. A lot of what I have to say, and remember I taught for 33 years in a Christian seminary, treats Christianity as the natural foil over against which I describe American Indians. And I don't mean to leave out Buddhists and Muslims and, and, and Jews and, and, and a whole variety of other people that might be in this room representing different traditions. But I remind you that, that, that Euro-Christians were our colonizer. And hence, in order to be decolonized and reclaim the Indian self, we have to constantly be taking apart that Euro-Christian language 
that all of you who live on this continent have inherited. It's not just your Christians, but, but even American Indians, and Muslims, and Jewish Americans, and, and Buddhists. Use that language. Use that discrete set of metaphors to talk about the world as if it were actually there. When in fact, they're just metaphors. But then they create a hard bedrock of reality that we Indian people have to fight against if we're going to reclaim ourselves. The title of the talk that, that uh, uh, was circulated among you and, and the one I asked for is Individual Salvation versus Cosmic Balance an American Indian post-colonial perspective. That's that contrapositioning of Indian worldview versus the Euro-Christian worldview. And salvation didn't mean much to Indian people. We didn't have that word in our language until the missionaries came and said, you need this. Let us pick one of your words and that serve for that Euro-Christian notion of salvation. Salvation from what? Well, they weren't willing to allow that it might be salvation from the Euro-Christian colonial <laughs> conquest that was on our doorstep. But along with that kind of language, and for us, of course, the title says it already, for us the ideal is harmony and balance in the cosmic whole. Harmony and balance in me, in our community, in our families, our clans, our nation, and the world of all the other living things, relatives, people that surround us. Like those trees outside there. The squirrels who are climbing out the branches of those trees. The birds that are landing there for a moment of respite. Harmony and balance of all that universe. And every ceremony we have is dedicated to that even if we're working towards the healing of one person in the community, the healing of that person comes with the harmony and balance of the whole. So let me step back again into that cauldron, that fiery cauldron of colonized language and begin by saying the one thing that I want to leave you with tonight is that we don't have any word for God. There's no word for God in Washaji or in any of the Indian languages I know anything about either in the north, northern continent or in the southern continent. Oh yes, you can read books. <coughs> Even talk to Indian people who will talk the language of Creator. What do they mean by Creator? Well, in one, one large tradition on this continent, the Creator is Sky Woman and Lynx Woman working together and the two twin sons of Lynx Woman. That's the Creator. Wait a minute. What happened to, you know, him? What happened to the one? 
Well, Bart met a, a Seneca grandmother and, and, and teacher at University of Toledo in Ohio assures us the number one is dysfunctional. <laughs> And yet you have all this anthropological literature devoted a generation ago to arguing whether American Indians are polytheists or monotheists. What if we're neither? A colleague of mine at the University of Denver um, interrupted our dialogue one day in a seminar that we were teaching together and he said, but Tink, I'm not a part of that because I'm an atheist. I put my head down momentarily and finally I looked up at my friend Luis. I said, Luis, but admit it, you're a Christian atheist. That's the only worldview, the only framework around which he had to describe his atheism. It's the only way he could be not involved with the God was to be unpacking his own childhood, which after all was in a Pentecostal church. We're not atheists either. At this point, we have more in common maybe with Buddhism, who claim a non-theistic tradition. But for us, it's more complex even than that, because we have a whole worldview that depends upon not identifying a creator. Oh, sure, the missionaries found one. They came in droves, learned little bits and pieces of our language and then said to us in our language, you were God. This one, your word, God. You know, fluent Osage, right? Uh, <laughs> so they picked a word. And the word they picked was Wakanda. I, and I know you think it's the title of an African-American movie. <laughs> It really belongs to us. And they didn't ask before they borrowed it. And however great a movie it is, it's still our word and our language, and we get to fill it in with meaning, not Hollywood. So Wakanda became our word for God. Wakanda is short for Wakantanka. Wakantanka. And if you go to friends, you know they say Wakantanka. Just a dialectical difference, important dialectical difference. Uh, kind of the difference between somebody from Boston and somebody from Colorado. <laughs> Wakantanka was in God. I know, it gets translated the great spirit so you have christian churches liberal mainline christian churches on that sunday once a year that the denomination has decided is uh, you know native american emphasis sunday <laughs> you have a whole congregation praying to the great spirit as if it were a real thing. Well, first of all, we don't even have spirits. Because we're... Now we've got to get into the physics of the Indian worldview. I used to call it metaphysics, but it's not metaphysics. It's physics. We're materialists. Everything in the universe has material shape and form. Astrophysicists know that, John. <laughs> there is nothing that is just what you Christians call spirit. 
Even the wind has a shape and a form. So what is Wakan Anka? Well, uh, you've got to break it down syllabically and, and into the, the, its two words, Wakan Tanka. Tanka does mean it ain't that simple. I could say it means big, but that's only one sense of the word Tonka. It can mean most memorable, most important. Waka and Waka, far from being spirit, you know, it's like Colorado Springs. They had that place up there in the hills called Manitou Springs, and everyone thinks that's the Cheyenne word for spirit, right? You know, it's much more complex than that, much more uh, important than that. And Wakana for us is not just spirit. Well, the other translation is given, that's your word for sacred. And y'all are doing the sacred story sharing, right? It doesn't mean sacred for us. We don't have that word sacred. It, you know, and all over the country, there are Indian groups gathering together to talk about sacred sites. It's a political argument. We want the U.S. government to recognize our sacred sites that have been sacred from time immemorial. But when you dig deeply into that worldview, into that, again, you call it spirituality. It's another word we don't have. <coughs> dig down beneath the concrete here, and this earth is sacred. Where that grass is growing, that is sacred space. That tree is sacred because it's alive. It has its own, own, own life-giving source of energy. If it's sacred, and every bird in that tree is sacred, and the squirrels are sacred, you end up with worms in the, coming up out of the grass. They're sacred because the grass wouldn't be as green as it is without earthworms. So ultimately, everything is sacred. Each one of you is just as sacred as that tree. That may be an overstatement. <laughs> So, if everything is sacred, what does the word sacred mean? Is there anything left? If there is nothing that is not sacred, what does sacred mean? You know, in, in historical Christianity, it's clear, you know, the sacred is up on the altar when the priest uh, um, is, is saying Mass, right? Uh, saying those prayers over bread and wine. And, uh, and there are certain songs that are sacred and others that are not. And Martin Luther got in trouble because some of his hymns were based on uh, bar tunes. And people were saying, that's not sacred. But for us, we don't divide the world into sacred and secular. There is no sacred, there is no secular, there is just the cosmos, just us. So if Wakan doesn't mean spirit or sacred, what does it mean? 
Well, we can pay, take it apart. And it's harder and harder to do because we're losing these languages and losing our understanding of them <coughs> because the Euro-Christians insisted that all our children had to learn English, had to go to boarding school. So we're only now to recover language reservation. Well, Kai has two syllables, wa, it means that which is, and ka, which means able to give life or take life. Able to give life and take life. And that tree's wakam because it's able to give life and take life. Yeah, lightning hits it and it falls over and crashes into a car and kills the driver. It's taking life. And at the same time, it gives life because it adds oxygen into the air. Um, and not only that, it puts shoots and, and raises its own young ones, right? Except in a manicure. And you've got to have a, a lawn care specialist come in and cut out all the shoots. <laughs> it's able to give life and take life. That's all of us, too. I mean, it's men. Although, in an Indian sense of the world, it's particularly women. And that's why women always have a higher status in our communities than men do. As the life givers, uh, you know, our tribes, were, our nations were always matrilineal, matrilocal, and even matriarchal. And that gets lost because the missionaries could not deal with it the first thing they said, Jesuits in 1630s uh, in the Northeast, uh, Maine and Canada. The main problem here is that the women are unruly. <laughs> they won't pay attention to their men. Of course, the priests are all men, right? And they come out of that patriarchal system where, in fact, men focus of power. So waka is that which can give life or take life. And tonka, that which can give life and take life, which is foundational in the cosmos. That's different from anything. Like God, it doesn't have gender. It doesn't have uh, personhood. Because Wakanda is here, in me, and in each of you. Wakanda is a part of what makes us alive, just as it makes that squirrel out there alive. So that squirrel has Wakanda just as you and I have. It's not that which makes me powerful, it's that which makes me alive. And the missionaries come in and say, that's your word for God. And then we have to rethink Wakanda because then all of a sudden, we've got this person because the Euro Christian colonizer wants us to personalize Wakanda, right? Make it humanoid, created in the image of human beings. Then my next job is, I better give it a gender. What gender am I going to give? Everything's got a gender. Nothing in the world exists without gender. What gender is Wakanda going to be? Well, the answer is, and all the elders back on my observation who stand up praying Osage, 
And then when they're done praying in Osage, they translate into English, My dear Heavenly Father, colonized to the nth degree, because Wakanda was never a father or a mother. It's that which gives each one of us life. So how are we going to be in balance with one another? How are we going to reclaim this perspective of harmony? Well, if I pick a gender and make that gender male, I have immediately introduced a wild I've introduced hierarchy into a world where hierarchy did not exist the way it does in your Christian world. And everything is hierarchical. In this. I use your Christian, by the way, not in a religious sense, but in a sociological sense. Uh, this continent is your Christian dominated. I mean, whether you want to agree that Donald Trump is Christian or not, he is Euro-Christian. He can't escape that. He was born into it, as were uh, most of you. Uh, you know, everything is hierarchical from God to priests or pastors, ministers, and lay people to the political structure of president, Congress, the states, and eventually the people who vote, right? They're down at the bottom. Uh, it's there in, in the economic system, in the business world, where you have CEOs, middle ma upper management, middle management, uh, supervisors, and finally the people who do the work. who get paid about one three hundred and sixteenth, I heard, of what a CEO gets paid. Um, that's hierarchy. And our world isn't, and people will interrupt me at that point and say, but Tink, you had chiefs. Oh, bingo, sit down, <laughs> be quiet. Except the truth is, we were better than that. We had two chiefs. Every village. One, and they traded you every other day being in charge. So I kind of had to be on the same page. You know, it's not like having Hillary Clinton on Mondays and Donald Trump on Tuesdays. <laughs> Yeah, they couldn't go out on a buffalo hunt, and this is one of their main tasks, is to give direction to the hunting party and say, okay, we're going to go west today and wake up the next morning, and, and, and the, the, the honka chief says, okay, we'll go east today, looking for buffalo, and you end up back in your own village, <laughs> right? So there's something else going on here besides hierarchy. Turns out that these Gaiga, we don't even call them chiefs, the word is Gaiga, had very little authority other than to host strangers, even enemies who came into the village, into the center of the village, to one of their houses. See, our power and authority is stretched out around the whole community. So that before the Osage community could decide to go to war, first of all, once they decided it's, we have to go defend our borders, the two Gallegos are stripped of all authority until that's over. They're no longer in charge of anything. 
And then it's the council of little old ones, about 70 elders who sit down and make the decisions and begin the ceremony. And the ceremony doesn't work unless someone, an elder, from each of the 24 clans is present. And they all have a part in the ceremony. So that, for instance, the pipe, which is brought in to help the defenders, is brought by somebody from either the Wasabi clan or the Puma clan. They're the two keepers of this particular pipe. But then you're going to have tobacco to load the pipe. And it took someone from the deer clan to come and bring tobacco so that the pipe could be loaded. And someone else is holding the pipe who is neither a Pum clan or deer clan has some other role in the community so that eventually you cannot send young men out into the face of danger to defend the borders unless all 24 clans have agreed and have participated in sending these men out. That's phenomenal. It took, we're told, 13 days to do this ceremony from beginning to end before the young men could leave. Now, if President Bush had spent 13 days in ceremony before sending our forces into uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, I might have had some respect for that engagement. But it wasn't made around that kind of ceremony, nor were we all involved in making that decision. It was made for us in the hierarchy by those up at the top. Not even at the congressional level, but at the executive level, right? Right? Not even your senators got a chance to have a word on that until it was a fait accompli. And your the choice is, are you a patriot or not? Will you support this war or not? Because if you won't, you might not get reelected. So that the systemic hole is is just focused on getting the next layer of the hierarchy to agree with the top layer of the hierarchy. And we had little choice, even though, if you remember back, virtually all the major leaders of mainline denominations spoke out against going into Iraq. And about 80% of the population was against it until it happened. So it wasn't made down here with all of us. It was made up here. In the Osage ceremony, the final ceremonial act is when the wife of the bundle keeper brings the bundle into the middle of the ceremony, gives it to the Dodonghonga, who's going to lead this, the, the, this defenders group out into battle. In other words, after 13 days of ceremony, comes the decision of one mother. Who says you all can go or you can't go and if she won't deliver the bundle if she won't hand it over the council of elders has to go back into session and rediscuss it and they start the ceremony all over again it's that serious it's that kinds of checks and balances that kinds of harmony and balance So when we do all kinds of things that get so romanticized 
among New Age people. Like the vision quest. <laughs> have you done a vision quest? Yeah, we have other names for it. And it's not, the word vision isn't in it. And in fact, we don't go engage in that kind of, of alone time in order to have a vision. <coughs> Might have a vision. But I knew an old man up in South Dakota, Lakota man, who had been going on vision quest for 20 years. And each time, his prayer was that he did not have a vision. He just wanted that kind of alone time to experience the harmony of the cosmic whole in which he was embedded. Because you're never alone. You're on the ground on Mother Earth. You're surrounded by plants and herbs, grasses and trees. And all kinds of animals come around to visit you while you're sitting there alone for four days. My memory is the animal that came to see me most was the mosquito. Others say, the scholars, this is significant because it demonstrates the radical individuality of Plains Indian people. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That's an attempt to kind of force Indians to look like Christians. I may be alone on the hill for four days and four nights with no food and no water. That's serious commitment. Not to enhance my spiritual power, but in order to talk to the Wanagi who come about the well-being of the whole community, the well-being of the one person that caused me to make this decision to do this. It's the harmony and balance of the whole. It's not about my spiritual self-enhancement, about my salvation at all. Yet when New Agers come out to the reservation, they say, can you put me on the hill? I want to have a vision quest. They're looking for that personal spiritual power that comes from accomplishing that kind of a heroic feat. And let me tell you, four days and four nights with no food and no water, it's pretty heroic. I mean, you don't do that and come down the hill able to talk because dehydration has just sapped the energy of your vocal cords. So you sing your heart out the first two and a half days and by the end of the third day, there's nothing left. Am I out of time? Oh good, because I'm not done yet. <laughs> Who am I talking to? And you'll hear people say, yeah, we go on the hill, not to have a vision quest, but to pray. Uh, we don't have that word in Osage. Lakotas don't have that word. No Indians have that word. Because pray immediately presumes you're talking to a good AA language, a higher power. But no, in our world, there is no higher power. They're just relatives who have different power, like like, like, like you have relatives with different energies and different gifts and, and different talents, right? Uh, neighbors with different talents who can help you when you have certain needs and you can help them when they have needs. 
It's not a greater power, but we are doing the work of Bata in Osage. Bata, which is the word the missionaries picked to mean prayer. But it turns out it only means to speak, to have conversation. Because we're calling in our equals to have conversation with them. And they have gifts we don't have, so we can tell them what we need. And they need us because they can't come back into this world unless we summon them with particular songs and, and inner ceremonies that we have. I use the Osage word, wanagi, to talk about them. And there are all kinds of wanagi who come in from those other places. We, we now, thanks to modern theoretical astrophysics, can begin to understand those old Indian people were talking about. There's things like string theory. Uh, posit now as as axiom that there are many universes layered one on top of the other. Interesting metaphor, huh? Different universes. Our ancestors knew that, and they were calling in the one up from that other universe, which is where that energy, that walk on to energy from a human being goes when, they, when it leaves the body, when that person dies. So we bury the body, take care of it in a careful way, but it's just a body. The Wanagi of that person has gone on into the Wanagi world. Now, <coughs> our job is to call it back into ceremony so that we can have conversation. That's very different from calling in the spirits and praying on high and talking about getting help from some higher power. We can get help from these Wanagi. There's no doubt about it. We've experienced it. You know, the uh, one final thing I'll, I'll leave you with before I open it up to your Q&A. People ask me, because I'm the expert, right? <laughs> the Baldrige Professor of American Indian Cultures and Religious Traditions, now emeritus. What do Indians believe? I tell them, Indians don't believe anything unless they've been converted to Euro-Christian cultural values. We don't believe anything. We deal in knowledge. We know. Now, not everyone knows the same things, but again, remember, we're not talking hierarchy, we're talking harmony and balance and different, different gifts and different knowledges through the community. I have a little girl Nine and a half years old, fourth grade. We don't ask her to believe anything about these ways. We only ask her to participate with us in doing them, in engaging them. So from a very early age, when she was yet four years old, she was my cedar girl. She would take cedar out of the bag and put it on the charcoal for me so that I could smudge people at four winds, smoke them off, purify them with the smoke from that cedar smoke. My boys who are all in their, well, they're not in their 30s. One of them's in his 40s. They're just growing up. 
Nobody ever told them, you know, want to know what does cedar smoke mean? What does sage mean? And I'll make something up and tell them and say, well, there, I've told you more than I've ever been told myself. Nobody ever told me this. We just learn to do it and experience it and know what it is from doing it over countless years and even decades. And she's beginning to learn that. The one thing she is learning is that when she goes to school, all the other kids want to talk about God. And she finds it hard then to toe the line and say, we don't do that. We don't have that. What she doesn't do is say, I don't believe in God. Because you can't believe in something, you can't not believe in something, when belief isn't a part of your structure. When in fact, we function on what we know and experience. When we go into ceremony, Iongli, sitting with the stones, everyone in the circle has equal access to these wanagi. No one has an edge over anyone else. Least of all, the person pouring water in that position of responsibility near the door. Nope, everyone has their own immediate access and experiences it. They can see the wanagi when the wanagi come in in the dark. They can hear the wanagi when we sing them in. Um, open to everyone who's in that lodge. So it's not a matter of just that one person who's the magic worker up at the altar who does all that on behalf of people and you experience it secondhand through them. For us, it's a primary experience. And that's all there is. That's all there is. They take that home with them and live out of it. Nobody tells them how to do that, what to do. As our mutual friend Shannon Glenn Morris likes to say, in the Indian world, there are no bosses. There are no bosses. I might give a young man, a young woman, my recommendation. But I learned when I was young, when an elder gave me a recommendation, I was not obligated to take it. I was obligated to listen to it and think about it. That's all. So that's our, a little glimpse into our world of what I call collateral egalitarian <laughs> harmony and balance as opposed to a hierarchy where there's knowledge up high and it trickles down <coughs> children. We want to children get it so we create Sunday schools, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying it's different. It's a very different model of understanding the universe. And my fear is under late colonialism, we Indians are losing something that's very precious and very important. And finally, are being Euro-Christianized. Kakuna. I'll stop here and hear from you all. <laughs> Who would like to go first? Who has a question? Back there.
Yes, I just wanted to ask uh, what uh, role does artistic creation play in the oxygenation? First of all, uh, uh, Indian people, like most human beings, have uh, creative abilities and interests. But, but, but the art that we produce very much reflects this worldview uh, of harmony and balance, of collateral egalitarian. Uh, quite often, the, uh, the, what you might call artwork is actually part and parcel of a ceremony. Not always, um, but you could tell as you pulled into a, uh, rode into a, say, a, a Crow or Lakota village, you could tell whose lodge was whose by the decorations on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the buffalo hides of the lodge itself. Uh, so it's very personal, very individual. At that point, everything is personal because there are no rules, per se. There are no bosses to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. I've got an old Zuni piece on my wrist, and maybe I'll take a minute to show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it will be offensive to some people because it looks like a swastika. Uh, it's not. This predates the abuse of that symbol by Nazi Germany. It was made in the early 1930s and uh, uh, was given to my grandfather and his name is inscribed on the inside of it. Uh, that's a life symbol. You know, the, 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 the uh, four directions symbol in a whirlwind represents the creative energy of the cosmos and the four directions of the, of the winds that come in uh, to our world. Thank you so much for this evening. Um, we are taught that the Indians have, the, have been the most exploited race in this country, uh, impoverishment and highest suicide rate. In light of all that you said, do you have any knowledge about how Osage fares uh, in light of your fellow Christian, um, <laughs> North American Indians? Well, indeed, uh, th th that's not just an assertion that, that Indians have been the most exploited. To this day, American Indians are the, and we're not a race, right? But race is a terrible word to use when you're talking about Indians. I mean, is Apache the same race as a Mohawk? Is a Lakota the same? Uh, race is a Hopi. Uh, if you're going to use race, you've got to look at each different uh, community as a separate race. But to this day, the unemployment rate among American Indians uh, runs roughly 50%. That is, uh, 10 times the national average plus five times the African-American average. And it's unreported. You wouldn't know it because the, the Department of Labor has a way of, of erasing Indians who don't, can't find jobs. You know, if you're too discouraged to look for work over a certain period of time, you're no longer counted. So you sit home without a job in squalor and poverty. Reservations like Pine Ridge vary from year to year between 87 and 90 plus percent. Rosebud, pretty much the same. In fact, 
if you look at a list of the 10 poorest counties in North America, the last time I looked, six of those counties were Indian reservations. It's that pointed. Um, Osage Nation is one of those who does a little better than others. I mean, the truth is, you all made a mistake 112 years ago when you gave the Osages that little corner of Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. But our white relatives, the Euro Christian relatives, they made up for it because they ended up with nearly all of that oil wealth in their own pockets. But we still had enough to make life at least livable on our reservation for most people. Not all. We have poverty on the Osage, uh, but at least we have a, a, a government that's fairly well uh, funded. Uh, there to provide me with, uh, in retirement, the uh, Medicare Supplemental Insurance, which is a big gift. But that's the state of, of economic affairs, social economic affairs in Indian country. Next. Do you have a word for leadership? Yeah, but that's complex. It's always complex. It's never one for one. Languages are not simply codes for each other. And if you can unpack the code, you know what uh, language A is saying to language B. For instance, among those young men who go out to do battle. There are eight Kaitsake, four from each of the two divisions. Even the divisions of the Osage bring together heaven and earth into harmony and balance. Uh, so there are eight Kaitsake who are the battle leaders. Not one, eight. Among those Kletsake, two of them are Kletsake uh, Tonga. Kind of the head leaders. But again, like Gahega, there's not one of them, there's two. So that even their harmony and balance, input from all, is very much a part of creating a, 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 a strategy to defend uh, the land, the territory, against the incursion of another tribe that thinks they need a little more territory to feed their people. Nick, Nick any other questions? The word uh, Watanhanka, could you give some examples of using that in sentences within within the realm of the Indian worldview? Albert Whitehead argued that Wakantanka didn't even exist before the missionaries. I happen, and, and he's a great Lakota linguist, I happen to think he's wrong because it's there in songs. Uh, Wakantanka, and what was the other word? That's it, yeah, yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are. Old, old healing song. We are, 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 Makaki jelo, wani wachi yelo he. 
calling on the Wakantaka uh, to come and render assistance. Now, in this case, it's not just uh, the Wakonda that is you or me, but it's the Wakonda outside of us, out here, that we're calling in. Uh, and we're saying, Wakantaka, Wakonda, come to us from the universe, from the four directions, and be with us here. No. But we are talking about the Wanagi. But to say synonym is just too simple. Yeah, we are actually calling them at that point, Wakantaka. Uh, uh, ra rather than defining them with a synonym. The other thing is, Wakantaka is not a singular in this case, it's a plural. I, uh, as a young man, was going into ceremony with a Bule uh, Yeshka, uh, an old man who had spoken in Dunkashila. It's a word that people think it means grandfather, but it doesn't. It means it's much more complex than that, but let it mean grandfather for the moment. I said to him, Norbert. When you call in Wakantaka, which one are you calling in? Because I knew he had like 409, 402 different Wanagi that came to his altar. And he gave me a funny look and he said, Why, well, Tink, all of them, all of them. See, our language doesn't distinguish with an inflection on the noun between plural and singular. So you have to pick it up from context. And I was young and naive and uh, still thinking, you're a Christian English? And, and he didn't know that I was thinking you're a Christian English? And hence he treated it as a serious uh, Lakota, Lakota question, um, and I learned a great deal in that instant, because <laughs> suddenly I remembered, oh yeah, of course, he's calling all of the men. We live in a world surrounded by birds and trees and butterflies. Could you give us some sense in the Indian experience how things came to be. Yeah, different people have different stories about that. Uh, and of course, uh, the Euro Christian interpreter wants to know which one is true. <laughs> and, and of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, the easiest one to unpack and I can do it fairly quickly, it is the Iroquois tradition, because we share some roots with Iroquois peoples too. Uh, Sky Woman comes down with a, an apron full of seeds that she grabbed up on her world before she fell through the opening and fell down to, to the face of the earth, which then covered with water. And, and it was only with the work of sea animals, and a turtle especially, that they were able to deposit the earth that she brought with her on the back of that turtle and create this continent that we call turtle, uh, North America at least, is Turtle Island. 
and, and then uh, uh, she was pregnant. She gives birth to a daughter, and her daughter and she then take all the seeds and plant them all over this turtle island. So seeds come from that. The flying things come from the sky world. They come down too. Uh, the animals. come just as people are created, as people are given shape and form, because Sky Woman, her daughter, uh, uh, Lynx Woman, and the two sons she has are not human in the way we are, but they're the ones who give life to all the other species, animals, your butterflies and birds, and that species of animal called the two-legged. But see, it takes four personalities, four persons, in order to do this, so that there's balance and harmony already there. And there's a, what Barbara Mann calls a twinning principle. There has to be both female energy and male energy. So there's two of each, two women and two men who are involved in this uh, the act that you all would call creation. So I had a question about education, being a retired educator. Um, and I know that the Indians were um, very abused with Euro-Christian education. Um, oh, but <laughs> so um, experientially, the way you've described it, there's a lot of education that goes on in Indian homes oh, and world and clans. A lot of what that goes on? Experiential. Education, education yeah. by experience. Yeah. Or yes. Within coming to the ceremonies yes. and those kinds yes. of things. So, um, what's the added, when I was thinking about it with the um, economic things you were talking about, um, and so often economic growth is tied to our rather linear look at education and how, you know, how is that looked at, uh, that um, formal, obviously you have engaged in that formal education process to some extent, and uh, so, but in general. Can you comment? <clears throat> yeah, I <coughs> taught in a graduate school. Yeah. My students were all masters and PhD students. I uh, got a chance to go over into an undergraduate department from time to time. I especially was called in to talk to uh, what at DU they call the Native Student Alliance but the Alliance of Native uh, American Indian Students. What I always told them, especially those who are involved in graduate education, is that you have to know twice as much as your white Euro-Christian colleagues. Because you've got to know everything they know and know it well, and everything we know from our side of the equation. See, it's not the case that Indians were educated ever. We had structures in place to teach kids all day long in a variety of ways. One of the things we had in, in most Indian communities, certainly Osages did, our young boys were turned over to a gay, you would call him gay, we would call him Tsekeki, to a gay, mature man to teach them how to be men. We would entrust, in other words, our young ones 
to the very people this socio, this uh, uh, Euro-Christian hall has characteristically feared. <laughs> I keep them away from our youth. Uh, we had a different sense of that. The Tzaykiki knows balance and harmony better than any man or woman because that person stands in between. So, yeah, that's, you know, we had ways of educating people. When uh, one of the colonialists in the East Coast, the first 13 states, somebody from Maryland, I guess, uh, invited one of the chiefs uh, of one of the Native nations to send us 10 of your young men so that we can educate them in our ways. The chief sent a message back and said, we would gladly do that if you will send us 10 of your young people to come here and learn our ways. Uh, the deal was never brokered, but, but education was forced on Indian people. And there's an ugly history uh, of uh, Euro-Christian boarding schools where, uh, uh, where our children, who are in actuality now our grandparents and great-grandparents, were raped by uh, Euro-Christian religious leaders uh, held captive in these uh, boarding schools. I was fortunate enough with friends to read a book by Kent Nurburn. Kent Nurburn is the last name, mm -hmm. Nurburn. Uh, an educator who worked for many years among a variety of uh, Native American Indian uh, schools. And uh, in the book Voices in the Stones, he made the comment that I found so true of myself. Um, and the comment, makes me appreciate so much the decision by World Wisdom's projects to focus on stories um, to help us bridge gaps. So the comment was something along the lines, I'll have to paraphrase a little bit, but he says that in this society, what you're referring to as the broader European Christian society, we generally view American Indians in one of two lights. The first with the perspective of kind of an idealized American Indian. The second with a perspective or with a sense of pity because we see the poverty. Um, maybe you've got some ideas in terms of other ways we can get out of that trap as members of this broader society. And, uh, but it seems to me that listening to your story, and maybe inviting uh, others to tell their stories would help us bridge those gaps. Yeah. Uh, my response would be to my Euro Christian relatives take the time, make the effort to come out to our countries and learn about us. I mean, that's hard to do. To take a week or two weeks of vacation time and find a way to come out to our reservation and find a way to meet people and get to know the reservation at a, at a deep level. Become an ally. I drove up here with uh, uh, a friend from Denver, Wally. Where are you, Wally? I don't see you. <laughs> All right, here in front. <laughs> uh, who works with Four Winds American Indians uh, Council in Denver uh, as, as an ally, as part of the support community, as they spent the last two plus years raising concerns about the Dakota Access Pipeline up on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation important work in the final analysis. They built the damn pipeline anyway, didn't they? 
They aren't going to listen to no Indians, and especially not a bunch of do good, uh, do good white allies. Uh, even when we were all lawyered up, it didn't help because the economic, socio-economic machinery of North America needed what? The money, the power that came by power, I mean authority, not fossil fuel power, uh, that came from drilling that pipeline underneath, uh, underneath the lake. So, uh, get involved. Come down and talk to Shannon at Four Winds. Uh, find out where you can plug in to what's going on in the community. John Lathrop has done that as long as I've known you, John. Been involved with Indian people. But it takes a real commitment to do that. It closed off other career development opportunities for you when you did that. It took that kind of sacrifice. I don't know of any other way to do it than that. Except come listen to some crazy lecture by it. A, a guy who says he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> You're a great storyteller. <laughs> uh, could you tell us a little, a little bit more about your personal path for education? And I'm assuming you lived on the Osage uh, Reservation. You might just tell us a little bit more about your personal story. Yeah, it's interesting enough. Uh, I came to Denver after finishing a PhD. And my, I'm, I'm usually introduce myself by saying I'm Indian on my father's side and Lutheran on my mother's side. <laughs> Lutherans know that's a joke because they know being Lutheran in, the, in America is, a, is an ethnic identity. <coughs> I did a PhD in Bible, in, in Christianity. I did a PhD in my mother in order to get some distance from her. I love my mother. She loved me. She was disappointed in me. She always thought I was going to become a Lutheran minister. It never quite worked out that way. Uh, but I needed distance from that to reclaim my father's side and my father's culture. When I came to Isla, was trying to walk on both sides of the line, holding them both in tension. And what I discovered is I couldn't do that for very long. It was ripping me apart. I was two people. And I had to make some choices. And Four Winds, going way back, Shannon, went through changes every year in those early years. We had an identity crisis every year. And finally came out affirming the Indian side of the equation and, and not the Euro-Christian side. That doesn't mean we leave our Indian relatives behind who have attached themselves to one of your churches. They're still welcome to come in with us, but they also know where we stand. So that uh, there's a Navajo minister in Denver. What's their church? Is it non-denominational or? Yeah. Yeah, what's the denomination? Yeah, yeah. Well, the last two, two years, He's taken to hauling a truckload of firewood back from the Navajo Reservation when he goes down there to bring out to our sweat lodge to help us in our ceremonies. So he's still in that position of a foot of both 
sides of the line, good for him. He's a wonderful man uh, and, and his wife, but we made a different decision, went a different way. In 1989, 1986, I did that non Jean ceremony, that standing on a hill for, for four days and four nights. I built up to four days. This was the first time I only did two and then three and then four in successive summers. And it changed me, brought me into a new understanding of my relationship in the world with all, all people, humans and others. And then in 1989, after doing that ceremony four summers, I decided, uh, along with some other Indian Christian clergy, that we were under you know, some conversation with one of the Sundance chiefs in South Dakota to dance in a Sundance. That's four days and four nights with no food and no water, out in the sun dancing all day. It was hard to turn back after that. It was hard to put that away and reclaim my mother's identity. And that's what disappointed my mother, I think. Although, she's my mother, she's proud of me. <laughs> Any other questions? Would you mind saying a word or two about the ceremonial uses of the feathers you're holding? Are you sure it's eight o'clock? <laughs> I knew it would be complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Les Negros Marc It doesn't explain everything, but it's a place to start for me, personally. I'm a member of the uh, Bald Eagle Clan. These are my close relatives, these eagles. And, and this one is the fan I've had the longest. It's actually the smallest, but it travels. So it's been with me on five continents. I carry my fan holder in a backpack. I never checked, but I carried it into Australia about five, six years ago. And they asked you to fill out the customs form. You know, U.S. does it too. I never thought about it. But Looking at it, under penalty of fine or imprisonment, are you carrying any animal parts? <laughs> I said, yeah. So I showed it to the, uh, the guy at customs who was checking our baggage. And he went into a, a, you know, a tizzy fit. He didn't know what to do. He consulted with other, other uh, customs officers went to their supervisor, the supervisor went to a super... Meantime, Canadian Indian, it's another eagle, by the way, uh, Harley Big Eagle, uh, was waiting for me to clear customs so we could share a cab together to the conference uh, in town. And I'm afraid I'm gonna lose him. He's gonna get tired of waiting for me. After a half hour, the senior, senior, senior superintendent <laughs> of customs agents takes me over to a separate counter, is talking to me. I won't let him touch my fan. That would be a violation. I go into prison. The guards need to know they can't touch anything I bring in. If they have questions, call the warden. 
but you can't touch it. I'll show you everything, but you cannot touch. And so a guy's looking at it, and I won't let him touch it. He says, Mike, you naughty. <laughs> yes, sir. Get out of here. He passed me through customs. <laughs> and I threw it all straight. <laughs> yeah. This relative goes with me wherever I go. Um, I just have a quick question to try to interpret a little bit of the uh, one statement in the program here that uh, talks about how the survival of the American Indian and their cultures, uh, cultural values may make the difference for the survival and sustainability of the earth as we know it. I guess from what you have said, I've picked up certainly some glimpses of this, some ideas, but could you address that a little more specifically, please? I'd love to because it's important and, and uh, we just can't do everything in a short evening talk. But that up-down image schema that dominates Euro-Christian uh, worldview and culture, uh, that hierarchy means that there's a force, an extractive force to take from those who are down at the bottom in order to empower those who are at the top. Whether it's CEOs earning 316 times what the average of their workers earns, or, or whether it's uh, uh, making your fortune by extracting other relatives from the earth, clear-cutting lumber, digging deep into the earth to bring up coal, pumping oil, going down, what, what do they do in South Africa, two miles into the earth deep in order to find the best diamonds. That hierarchy makes that extraction just run amok. And that's what happened uh, to, to uh, <coughs> the Cheyenne River and Standing Rock Sioux Nations up at Cannonball uh, in South Dakota two winters ago. The force for extracting just overpowered all resistance on site of native people what I'm saying is, I see no end to that. It's going to continue in one form or another. It'll be shape-shifting forever. But you've got to feed hierarchy. The collateral egalitarian has a very different relationship. We can extract a turquoise from the earth, but only when we do the appropriate ceremony, ask permission, and explain why it is we need that particular turquoise at this particular moment. And I mentioned Sundance. When we go out there, Fourth day of preparation in this 12-day ceremony. Fourth day of preparation is the day before the dancing actually begins. We go out to a tree that they've selected. And in order to have this dance, we must have a tree in the center of the dance arbor. That tree is the total focus of our energies through the dance. Even though they call it a sun dance, it's really a tree dance. So we go out to that tree with ceremony and offerings and in a particular respectful way 
involving the first blow of an axe being delivered by a child, an innocent, and, and all kinds of other ways to make that tree understand, to help, ask that tree's permission to come with us, to let that tree understand why this is important to us, and making our commitment to make sure that other trees will continue to thrive, even in this very spot where we're cutting down a tree. Is that helpful? I'm saying that would be helpful to all Americans, to the whole globe, if we could somehow begin to reclaim that collateral egalitarian, because I believe, and I've got some evidence to argue for it, that ancient Europe had that worldview. Just as every indigenous people still does on the continent. I've talked about it with, with, with people in Africa, uh, Polynesian peoples, Maoris in New Zealand, the Aboriginals in Australia. They have that same sense. It won't produce as much wealth as the hierarchical schema has, but it produces wealth only for a few of at the great cost to the many. In the last generation, the wealth has been focused in the United States, and the poverty has been spread throughout you know, the, what, what, what I call the two-thirds world. Professor Tinker, I wonder if there's anyone uh, from any other tribe who might be here tonight who would like to share their particular perspective on that question. There may be some other tribal members here who have had experience or who want to speak to that point. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna have, this is the takeaway. Shannon, can you stand up? So you wanna introduce yourself? Right on like schedule. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm uh, Shannon Francis, I'm Towering House Clan, born for Red, running into the Water Clan. I am uh, the great, great, great granddaughter of our last leader, Lola Ma from Hopi, 3rd Mesa, Kikotsmovi Village. Um, I, ha I am the 12th, uh, 13th generation seed keeper for my people. And um, I have six children. I have a grandson that's two years old, and I have two more granddaughters coming. We say when the granddaughters are conceived that I will become a great grandmother because the female babies already carry the eggs. So that makes me a great grandma. Mm -hmm. My level of a grandma, when I first became a grandma, the responsibility changed for me. I am Masa clan from the Hopi side and um, Bear clan from the Hopi side. Towering House clan, which is one of the original four clans in Dene. Uh, Masa is caretakers of um, the earth and Bear clan are caretakers of the people. So I have a lot of responsibility. Um, my Hopi name is Tawanyanim and I have a lot of, uh, who's named after the daughter of the last, one of the last leaders who was a chiefess. If that's a word that you can, um, I don't know if it's a created word or what, but um, I have the responsibility. I'm the chair at Four Winds. I came after Tink. I was actually volunteered by Glenn Morris um, to come on the council the first 10 minutes of the meeting, and that was in 2000 and, uh, oh my God, I can't even remember, 2014. And uh, just happened to love being doing what I'm doing for a community. I've been doing it since I was 16. Became a part of the American Indian Movement of Colorado at 24. And um, now a community servant. So we have an indigenous permaculture garden at Four Winds. We've been growing, this is our third year. This year we primarily focused on indigenous seeds. 
I'm an indigenous permaculturist, a certified permaculture designer and instructor. That doesn't mean anything because that's my genetic memory, but I have to have the paper when I'm going to different conferences to, prevent, um, to present. So I uh, started this garden project. We started this garden project because it's not just me. We have a lot of volunteers. We started wanting to address the health disparities in our community, food deserts in our community, and bringing indigenous foods for native tribes and nations that were coming through Four Winds that were looking for different types of squash, um, but also things that were helping to fight cancer, um, prevent diabetes, to lower high blood pressure, to lower high cholesterol. So we started looking at different seeds that were going to be doing that. So different types of squashes, indigenous corn, because the old heirloom strains um, are lower in sugar. Like the hybrids, um, the hybrid corn that you see today, and the, the kind that they sell in um, that's non-organic, are have, you know, they contain high um, sugar. And so when you eat the corn after it's a certain maturity at a certain, yeah, age, it produces more sugar. So um, the old strains don't have that. And so we're, we're growing some old strains in our garden. We are trying to do this delicate, delicately so that we don't cross-pollinate with GMO in the neighborhood, in Baker neighborhood. So we started growing some of the easier things, but this year we actually grew an abundance of Hopi amaranth. So I don't know if you guys don't know what Hopi amaranth is, Amaranth is a green, but the leaves from the plant are greens, and they taste just like spinach, but we also used it for a dye a long time ago. It sort of fell to the wayside because of the labor-intensive uh, massaging the seeds. In order to get a pound of seeds, it takes about 20 hours to massage, this, massage the seeds. So it's pretty intense, but we are so proud of this garden because we are giving food to our talking cir circle people, our talking circle folks. We are giving food to homeless folks and families that come through. And we're able to establish a larger seed inventory um, for next year. So we are very proud that we're only growing indigenous foods and showing our neighborhood what we can do, not just for ourselves, but for our pollinators, for our birds, for our, you know, all the raccoons and the squirrels that come that we have in abundance to feed our, um, our animal friends. So um, I just want to say that we, uh, my daughter, who's having the baby in a couple weeks, she spent a lot of time helping me package the seeds. My mom, who actually moved to Denver, she's Hopi from Kikosmovi, she spent um, four hours massaging seeds with me and telling me stories. So this is a family, um, a family, uh, I would say, um, for us, our gardens include family. And this is one way that we can give back our to, our, to our community. But I want to give World Wisdoms Project seeds from our garden. Um, this is something that we take very seriously. So being a seed keeper is something that when you are a seed keeper that you don't leave your seeds alone, you don't forget about them. All of these seeds were talked to by, by our youth. And what that means is the seeds are babies, they're our relatives. And all of the youth breathed on them to give them good energy, to motivate them, and to inspire them to grow. But in the scientific way, when you breathe on the seed, the biome from your breath, the seeds are introduced to that biome, and they can absorb your DNA, and that's how they know you. So when you plant them, and you come back, and when they're a plant, they, it's a familiarity so that they know who you are. So all of our seeds, we talk to our seeds, we sing to our seeds throughout their, their entire plant life. And we keep that going. So that's why our garden is thriving in the middle of Denver, because we have our youth coming to visit the plants. And um, they're, they're our relatives. When you change the language from elements to relatives, it has meaning. 
So we take our seeds seriously, but I want to, we want to give you seeds from our indigenous garden, but we also want to say that if you take these seeds, that you have to make sure that you don't forget about them, don't put them on the shelf and then, oh, I'm gonna you know, plant them in the spring. You have to constantly talk to them and make sure that they know that you're there. And when you plant them in the ground, you have to talk to them and to sing to them. And when you harvest your seeds, that you make sure that you give at least half of your seeds away and keep sharing. Because that's what we're doing is we're keeping a part of the harvest for our community, but we're sharing what we have because sharing over abundance, there's enough waste in this entire community to share everything that you have, but our seeds are something that are very important and it's taking three years for our seeds to acclimate to the soil. So we just want to say we are there if you need help. We have seeds, but we want to make sure that you understand that seed keeping and taking care of these seeds is very, is very serious. So don't take the seeds if you can't be responsible for them. But do take them, and there's about 50 to 100 seeds. There's a, they're really, really tiny. But if you can grow four plants, you're going to have probably about 10,000 to 20,000 seeds if you can grow full, mature plants. And um, share your seeds. Share your plants. And keep growing for Mother Earth and help her flourish and help her motivate and encourage her to help slow down climate change. Because we can't, we can't fight climate change. We can't change her, but she's starting to restore the balance now. So we have a choice to help her, or we have a choice that she's going to get rid of us. So I just want to say that's coming from my Hopi people, and I am very honored to be here tonight, and thank you, and hope to see you all again. So, yeah. Good way. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. So did you? Did you So she's going to take them out to the table on your way out. Now, remember what she said. Don't take them if you're not going to do what she said. So. But thanks so much, Shannon. I think that it would really be appropriate for us to sit in silence for a minute and just contemplate what we've heard and see how it enters into our lives and our practices. Let's do that just for one minute. And now, please join me in applause for our speakers, and thanks to them. And thanks to First United Methodist for hosting and co-sponsoring this event. We have circulated evaluations of this evening's uh, program, and hope you can take a few minutes to complete one, and as at past events, we'll do a drawing from the signed evaluations, either that you leave with us or that you return to us by email within 24 hours. And uh, we'll draw one from that group and award that person a $25 restaurant gift certificate. So we hope to see you at our next event, Stories of Spiritual Journey, Pilgrimages in the Jewish and Christian Traditions, October 11, 6.30 p.m. at Trinity Lutheran Church. Thank you. Good night. Safe travel.
Thank you. 